until you and I become accountable for our behavior. I didn't say even accountable to change it, but God cannot even change us until we become accountable because there's no real repentance without accountability. Wrong mindsets can keep you in bondage. Wrong thoughts and wrong attitudes can keep you in bondage. I'm sure you've heard the statement, your attitude determines your altitude. Well, really what that means is depending on your attitude, that's how far you can go in life. It's amazing how we can make our own life very pleasant and enjoyable by having a good attitude in every situation and how our life Although our circumstances can be good, if a person has a bad attitude, then they're not going to enjoy their life no matter what they have. Your attitude is very important. And the devil may, may be able to take a lot of things away from you. People may be able to take a lot of things away from you. But the one thing nobody can take away from you is a good attitude and good thoughts if you decide to have them. Your attitude belongs to you. And it really determines your peace, your joy, how you function with people, the way, you, the way you think determines your relationships. And so I want you to think about what you're thinking about and I want you to take a truthful inventory of your attitude in different situations. For example, what kind of an attitude do you have when you don't get your way? What kind of an attitude do you have when somebody else always seems to get the thing that you want? What kind of an attitude do you have when you are corrected? Hmm. We must have the holy bunch out tonight. <laughs> what kind of an attitude? do you have? It's important that we get honest with ourselves tonight. I tell you, even as an employer, there's nothing that really is more frustrating to me than trying to ask somebody what happened in a situation and just getting nothing but excuses, excuses, and blame, blame, blame. I love the people that just say, you know what? I was responsible for that. I should have done it right. I'm sorry. It was totally my fault. The minute that people do that, it's over. It's just over. It's like everything in you just wants to forgive them and just go on. And all God wants us to do is just take responsibility and admit the truth. In Psalm 51, 6, King David, when he was repenting from his sin with Bathsheba, said that God desires truth in the inner being. The first place we have to be truthful is in our heart about ourselves. Have a meeting with yourself. Ask yourself some very hard questions. Am I easy to get along with? Don't think I'm going to go so fast that you can't think about this for a minute. <laughs> How easy do I get offended? How touchy am I? How easy do I get my feelings hurt? How much of my time do I really spend trying to make other people happy? Or is it all about me, 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 me? How much time do I really spend in the Word? How many, how many excuses do I make for not spending time with God? Do I take my responsibilities and act like a man or a woman of God or am I always avoiding them and procrastinating and 
hoping I get by with it. And you know, we could stand here and go on and on and on and on all night. Have a meeting with yourself. I have regular meetings with myself. I'm serious. Part of my time with God is meeting with me. Taking a little inventory of my attitude and quick to repent, quick to make things right if I haven't behaved the way that I should. I don't want to carry around all those heavy burdens anymore. If you continue my word, you'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. But it's the truth about each one of us that will make us free. We're always trying to apply these messages we hear to somebody else that we know needs them. <laughs> You've already thought of 50 people that you know that you wish was here tonight. <laughs> and I wish they were too, but the point is you're here. <laughs> Genesis 16, 1 through 6. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she wanted a baby so bad. Oh, you got to be so careful when you want something so bad that you can hardly stand it because you are very vulnerable to starting to compromise to get what you want. Do I need to say that again? Yep. When you want something so bad, you just can't hardly stand it. It's stealing your peace. You got it on your mind all the time. You need to be very careful when you want something that bad because... It comes with a great temptation to compromise or to get into works of the flesh and try to do things yourself to make it happen rather than waiting on God. You know what lust is, I believe? <laughs> lust is wanting something so bad that you can't be happy without it. I really think, I mean, that's the definition that I felt like God put on my heart a long time ago. You can lust after anything. You can lust after a position in ministry. Honestly, you could become lustful wanting to be the worship leader in your church. <laughs> so she wanted a baby so bad she couldn't hardly stand it. And so she hatched a plan. She had an Egyptian maid, a handmaiden, a servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, now see here, the Lord has kept me from bearing children. So I'm asking you to have intercourse with my handmaiden. I mean, I don't know what she did with her brain, but <laughs> I can tell you that was a bad choice. It might be that I can get what I want through her. And Abram listened to and listened to what she said. Dumb. <laughs> Guys, we've got a lot of good advice to give sometimes, but sometimes you just can't listen to us either. And you ain't always right either. <laughs> so Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her Egyptian maid, and after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan, so they'd been there 10 years before this happened, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his secondary wife. <laughs> and he had intercourse with Hagar, and she got pregnant. Now here it comes. And when she saw that she was with child, she looked with contempt upon her mistress and despised her. Okay, right away now, Hagar gets a bad attitude. Then Sarah said to Abram, may the responsibility for my wrong and deprivation of rights be upon you. <laughs> this is not his fault. I gave my maid into your bosom and when she saw that she was with child, I was contemptible and despised in her eyes. May the Lord be the judge between you and me. And Abram threw it right back at her. But Abram said to Sarah, see here, your maid is in your hand and power. You do with her as you please. Nobody's going to take responsibility. It's been there since the beginning of the Bible, this blame shifting thing. And I want to tell you something. This is a fun message and, and we can get a lot of good laughs out of it, but this is desperately serious. I'm here to tell you until you and I become accountable for our behavior. I didn't say even accountable to change it, but
But God cannot even change us until we become accountable. Because there's no real repentance without accountability. And I love what Dave says. He says, you either make yourself accountable or you will be made accountable by your circumstances. Numbers 21.5, we've seen this several times this weekend. And all the Israelites blame God and blame Moses. Why did you bring us out here so we could have all these problems? Oh, I remember the years that I acted so bad. I was unhappy because I had a child and had to work a full-time job. So my boss let me cut down to four days a week and still paid me for five. I still didn't know how to be happy. I was happy about that, about two weeks. And then I was complaining to Dave that I just couldn't work. And, you know, I needed more time at home. And I needed more time with my child. And he said, well, you quit working. He said, I'm more than happy to cut back. We, don't, we can change our lifestyle a little bit. You know, go ahead. We, we can trust God. So I quit work. And then I wasn't happy because I didn't have any adults to talk to all day. And I was home by myself all day. And Dave got to get out in the world with all the people. And... You know, sooner or later, we have to wake up and say, is anything going to make me happy? Do I need to say this to every section? <laughs> let me pick on the TV audience, and I'll let you guys rest a minute. Maybe you need to ask yourself, is anything going to make me happy? Not until you decide to be happy. Jesus said, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. All this mad, sad, depressed, downtrodden, discouraged attitudes and being unhappy all the time and grumbling and murmuring about everything and always looking at what we don't have and not seeing what we do have, that's why we stay in the wilderness and don't enter the promised land. The same reasons why the Israelites did. If they could have got out there and kept praising God and thanking God for that manna and just being a blessing and helping one another, I tell you what, they would have made it through that desert so fast it would have made everybody's head swim. Every time we complain about something, we stay right where we're at for another period of time because God's waiting to see if we can have a good attitude even in the valley. So I can't say anything else about that and finish. <laughs> Number seven. <laughs> Self-pity. <laughs> okay, now I'm just going to tell you up front, I was addicted to self-pity. I mean, it was probably one of my biggest problems. And um, it was just the way I responded to everything that didn't go my way. If I didn't get my way, if Dave didn't give me enough compliments, if I cooked a meal and somebody said they didn't care for it, or You know, Lord only knows why. I don't really know what I do know why, but it's kind of a thing that's hard to explain. Anytime that I didn't like what Dave was doing and I would start to feel sorry for myself, I'd go to the bathroom and sit on the floor and put my head on the toilet and cry. <laughs> Any of you ladies ever cry in the bathroom? You want me to tell you why? Because there's a big mirror in there, and when you get done, oh yeah, I caught myself doing it one day. 
eyes are red, makeup smeared, mascara smeared, hair a wreck, I mean, look terrible. Get up, look at yourself in the mirror to see now how pitiful you are. <laughs> I mean, God showed me this stuff. So then, I would go through the room where Dave was at. <laughs> having fun watching TV while I had been cleaning house, slamming doors and drawers. When I was mad, I would clean house loud. And if one trip didn't work, I'd... <laughs> and I'll never forget, I will never forget this. One day he said to me, if you're going to the kitchen, would you make me an iced tea? <laughs> <You. laughs> but if the next day was Sunday, I'd get up, be mad all morning, pout, not talk to anybody go to church, and the first time we saw somebody else from the church in the parking lot or at the door, praise the Lord, how are you? <laughs> thank you, Jesus. How are we? Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you. Woo. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Get back in the car, fight all the way home, I can remember standing there singing the songs on the overhead screens, I surrender all, thinking if he thinks I'm cooking him anything to eat today, he's got another thing coming. I was out there in the wilderness just wandering around and around and around, wondering why the snake kept biting me. So finally I got it. Oh, I have sinned. <laughs> God does not like my attitude. <laughs> Self-pity is idolatry. It's turning in on yourself. And what about me? 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 Go ahead. What about me? What about me? What about me? What about me? I figured I might as well do it because you'll make me anyway. Now, how many of you never saw the robot on TV? Everybody's seen the robot on TV. All around the world, they've seen the robot on TV. Amen? Anyway, for the five of you that didn't. You know, we just get ourselves on our mind, what about me, what about me, what about me? God said, sometimes you remind me of a little robot. The devil comes and just winds you up. You know, wrong thoughts get you kind of wound up for the day. That's why it's important to do good thinking early. And he said, you remind me of this little robot. You got one song to sing. What about me? 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 Full of self-pity. It's the biggest waste of time. It doesn't change anything, it just ruins your day. A day that Jesus died for you to have. Well, it's not fair, it's not right. May not be. There's a lot of things in life that are not fair. I'm not the only one that has things happen that I don't like. You're not the only one. It happens to everybody. And that's why the Bible tells us that we are to have a good attitude no matter what the situation is. Because our attitude glorifies God. Whatever we're going through, our attitude glorifies God. And I finally learned, thank God, years ago I learned that it is not pleasing to God for me to go to church and go through all the motions while inside.
or put on a big show for my Christian friends and wear my Christian jewelry and have my bumper sticker and have my Christianese language, but behind home, at home behind closed doors, It's grow up time, isn't it? Hey, now I know we're people and I know we have days and I know we have feelings and I know we have emotions and I know that some days are harder than the others, but I just really want to encourage you as well as me. I know that changing my attitude has made my life like so, 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 so much better. And I know that it's opened the door for God to bless me in many, many ways. And when I started studying the Word and hearing sermons that were really things like I'm sharing with you tonight, things that challenged me and challenged my faith. And I went to church for a lot of years and all I heard was doctrine. And it's good to have good doctrine, but you know, we need to also know how to live. We need to know how to take the Word of God and apply it to our everyday life and nobody ever challenged me about self-pity I, I actually didn't even know it was a problem and I remember as I first began to get into ministry and I was so hungry to walk in the power of God and have the power of God flow through me and I wanted to get up in this pulpit and be powerful and preach a powerful word and see people healed and delivered and set free but then at home I wanted to be pitiful and God told me you can be pitiful or powerful but you can't be both so make your mind up and so maybe I need to say that to even just one person maybe there's only one person here tonight maybe you're in the balcony or maybe you're over here to the left or over here to the right or right down the middle or maybe it's somebody watching by TV and I just want to say to you that God's got some wonderful things in mind for you. You have authority as a believer in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power the enemy possesses and nothing shall by any means harm you. God has blessings in mind for you and fruitfulness a life that's fruitful and he wants you to have peace and joy but you cannot have power and pity at the same time he'll give you beauty for ashes but you've got to give up the ashes so why don't we just exchange all of our bad attitudes for some good attitudes have a meeting with yourself a couple of times a month or a week and start facing reality come on give God praise